I want to um, first say thank you. I mean, it's a privilege to uh, be here, and um, one of the wonderful things when you're a researcher is to have the opportunity to share your work. Um, it's a very privileged position to be in, um, and so I'm grateful for that opportunity, uh, and I appreciate you making time today. Um, I have a um, disclosure moment. I'm actually, I'm on a Fulbright here now, but I'm not actually on a Fulbright studying mean child trafficking. Um, having said that, um, I've worked on child trafficking issues for about 20 years now um, in research capacities, working on legislative initiatives, working um, with and for uh, different NGOs, primarily in the states. Um, so that is, this is my primary area of focus. Um, it just happens that I'm sort of also pursuing another project, um, which is why I'm here in Ireland this semester. Uh, but with that sort of disclosure moment, uh, what I want to do today uh, is three things. I want to uh, take a stroll down memory lane, if you will, and sort of assess sort of where we've been in the last 20 years on child trafficking. Um, then ask the question as to whether we're making progress and what that progress looks like. Uh, and then third, uh, then turn to the public health piece, which will be the bulk of the presentation, uh, and explore what does it mean uh, to have a public health approach to child trafficking. Uh, for those who are interested in child trafficking, what I hope is uh, this is an interesting, potentially new lens um, to look at the issue of child trafficking. Uh, and for those who are uh, public health people already, um, some of this will seem very obvious, um, but maybe what, it'll, what it will do is spark an interest in child trafficking um, because we could use the help. Um, so there's some sort of advocacy component to this secret, you know, sort of under the radar advocacy. Hopefully you'll be interested in this and actually get involved in this. Um, all right, uh, so let me start with a sort of stroll down memory lane. Um, as I said, I've worked on this issue some, for about 20 years, since the late 1990s. Um, when I first started, um, there, was no in, there was no sort of current international treaty, on, starting with the international level, there was no tr uh, treaty uh, on child trafficking or human trafficking. Uh, in, in the year 2000, two major international treaties uh, were adopted, including one, the, the trafficking pr protocol, sometimes referred to as the Palermo Protocol, which um, has a, a, its first internationally agreed upon definition of human trafficking. Um, so that's a really significant development. Uh, in the US, there was no anti-trafficking law. That also passed in 2000. It's been reauthorized a number of times. In, here in Ireland, it was 2008 when, the first, when human trafficking was recognized as a crime uh, in the law. Um, so we've seen a lot of legislative efforts in the last 20 years at the sort of international, national, and local levels on services to survivors or victims or survivors of trafficking. Uh, when I started 20 years ago, there was almost nothing. Um, it was done through sort of general so social services programs, if, if anything. Um, and there's very little specialized uh, work in this area. We now see um, a real shift happening um, in a number of locations, in a number of locales. So you see social services, child welfare agencies receiving training, you see healthcare professionals, uh, one of the exciting things, at least in the U.S., has been a real uptick in the number of uh, emergency departments uh, and other sort of healthcare providers that are starting to recognize the need to uh, be able to identify cases uh, when, when appropriate and sort of figure out what do you do once you've identified those cases. Um, and then the last, in terms of public awareness, 20 years ago when I, when I talked, when people would ask, what are you working on? I'd say, I'm working on trafficking. Almost everyone about 95% of the people I met immediately assumed I was working on drug trafficking issues. Uh, and the remaining 5% would start to tell me about their morning commute, somehow thinking that uh, was <laughs> traffic. Um, but uh, so there was really very little awareness. Um, now, today, you probably not a day goes by where you don't see a story um, in, in a major newspaper. Um, in the United States, January is recognized as National Human Trafficking Prevention Month. I guess if we prevent it in January, we're set for the year, so we only need one month. I'm not quite sure about that strategy. Uh, but you, you see this real change. You, hundreds of organizations now refer to themselves as anti-trafficking organizations. Uh, and there's some, you know, we can talk about that as well. Uh, but so we've seen a lot of change in the last uh, 20 years. I, I've never dealt with a podium behind me, so mm -hmm. this will be. Um, but now the question is, are we making progress? Um, so there's a couple of different ways you might answer that. Um, we have very good uh, 
we've, done, we've made some real progress in that we've adopted international, national, and local law, particularly strong around criminal justice issues or criminal justice components. Um, so there's been a lot of progress in that sense. Um, as I said, you, you've seen this sort of shift and really much more for victims and survivors of child trafficking uh, and of course, uh, greater awareness. So all that sounds good, um, but I guess I would ask the question again, are we making progress? And to me, uh, in this context, uh, as with a lot of other public health issues, um, the ultimate goal has to be prevention, right? Um, we make progress if we are reducing the prevalence of harm. Uh, and here, in the context of child trafficking, uh, there's very little evidence to suggest that all that work in the last 20 years uh, has changed, that changed prevalence at all. Uh, admittedly, it's really hard to know. We have very little, if any, reliable baseline data from 2000 or before. Um, so, so it's hard to accurately measure, but I think most people in this context, um, who are working in this context um, and doing sort of evidence-based research uh, would agree that um, there, isn't, there isn't clear evidence that there's been any decline. Um, similarly, there isn't any evidence that, it, that vulnerable children are less vulnerable than they might have been a decade ago. Um, so um, I would suggest then that um, something's missing in all this evidence, right? If, we're, if we put in all this work, all these resources, uh, and there doesn't seem to be clear evidence uh, that we've reduced the prevalence at all, um, then that suggests that maybe the approach we're taking is um, not the right approach, or at least it needs to be supplemented. Uh, I'd say this without sort of try, without diminishing the work that's being done by law enforcement to the extent that they're able to uh, apprehend perpetrators, that's obviously significant, to the extent that people are working to provide services for and assist um, survivors of child trafficking, absolutely essential work. Um, but um, what it set us up to do so far, without much focus on prevention, it set us up to, in this sort of endless cycle of uh, tr chasing perpetrators and trying to help um, survivors um, rebuild their lives. And that's not a sustainable cycle, or it's not a sustainable cycle that leads to good outcomes. Um, part of the reason for that uh, lack of progress is uh, much of what's happened in the first uh, nearly 20 years of the modern anti-trafficking movement has really been criminal justice focused. Uh, and I don't say that we sort of full blame to the criminal justice framework. Um, there are elements of that that are important. Um, but criminal justice, the criminal justice system is not designed to address root causes of why people end up being exploited. Uh, it's not structured to deal with the scope of harm that we see. Trafficking victims experience sexual, physical, emotional violence at the hands of traffickers and others. Um, criminal justice system is not set up for that. Um, and expecting it to deliver that um, is really a mistake on our <coughs> part. Um, and then it, it actually has not been particularly effective, uh, even in the areas where um, criminal justice uh, aims to work, right? So, crim so criminal law aims to do two things. Uh, help you apprehend bad actors and um, prevent and deter future crime, right? So there's, there's widespread agreement that we are only identifying a fraction of traffickers. Uh, and then on the deterrent side, there's, a, there's some really good work it, being done in the criminal justice context, which shows having a criminal law has some deterrent effect. Um, ramping up penalties thereafter has very little additional impact on on people's behavior. Uh, so uh, that's led me, led me some time ago to start looking at public health frameworks and bringing in some of the public health uh, methodologies um, and sort of move, trying to get the sort of work that's being done here to sort of move upstream. Uh, I suspect most are familiar, most of the people in the room are familiar, familiar with that idea of moving upstream. There's a lot of different versions of that story. Um, and so I'll hold off on the story since you probably know. Um, but let me talk about what a public health approach means uh, in this context and might offer. Um, there's a lot that we could talk about. I just want to highlight four pieces, right? So a public health approach is sort of always builds on evidence-based research. What we see in the context of human trafficking and child trafficking in particular is really very little evidence-based research. The vast majority of the work is, is 
that's published is not published in peer review journal. And we can all sort of have a separate conversation about how effective are peer review journals at um, sort of policing the work that, 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 that gets published. But at least that has some sort of peer sort of evaluation. Most of the work that's being published isn't. A lot of the work's being published by NGOs, some very well-intentioned, good work, but it may not, have, may not be evidence-based in the way that we think about evidence-based work. Um, and it's often ideologically driven, um, sometimes, with, again, with good intentions, um, but obviously that has an influence on sort of outcomes. Um, if you're mandated, as some organizations have been, by sort of governments, um, demonstrate that there's a need for, uh, for funding for human trafficking, then it's not surprising that their, their research report uh, finds high numbers of trafficked individuals, um, regardless of, the, you know, without sort of clear methodology. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in that context. Um, prevention, we, we, we sort of talked about, we'll talk more about it, um, but there's been very little emphasis on, in discussion of really even of prevention. Um, when I have been at meetings for the last 20 years and said, well, we should talk about prevention, the response tends to be twofold. One is um, somebody will mention something that really isn't prevention, it's, it's early intervention. Um, and there's sort of a conflating of those two concepts. Uh, and then two, um, there's a very, there tends to be a very simplistic uh, approach to prevention thus far, right? So what's happened is um, a public, well let's, well, let's do a public awareness campaign. Uh, one of the things you've seen in a number of jurisdictions recently um, is requiring businesses where we believe there might be trafficking victims uh, working or, or going, um, the governments require them to post a notice. Um, so that some version of, are you being trafficked, call this hotline. Um, well, what, one of the things we know from some of the evidence-based research in this area is trafficking victims don't self-identify, right, for the most part. They don't self-identify as trafficking victims. So posting a sign asking somebody to sort of the prompt of, are you a trafficking victim? If they don't self-identify, it's not really going to have much impact. Um, so there's a lot more we can talk about on the prevention side, and we will a little bit later. Um, one of the really interesting things about public health is, is we, in a lot of public health work, you can think about other forms of other violence against ch children uh, and public health methodologies. There, you can think about youth smoking, um, a lot of road safety. Um, it starts to look at under, under underlying behaviors and attitudes. Uh, in a really important way, in a way that really hasn't happened so much in, in the context of uh, human trafficking. Um, and the last piece is, um, it's not only public health that does this, but public health, to some extent, international development, and then say human rights, um, really does a, a, really puts an emphasis on identifying relevant stakeholders uh, and sort of building coordinated responses in a way that I think that you don't, you, you're starting to see in, in the context of responses to child trafficking but in a very limited way. Um, the last piece that I think is relevant in this context, and then we'll sort of apply it a little bit more in detail to, um, is the socio-ecological model, which uh, I'm sure most of the room are familiar with, right? So that um, the WHO, the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, sort of the US public agency, um, looks at these interplay between individual relationship, community, and societal factors, right? Uh, and one of the things that we've seen, at, just like the notice, example I gave you a moment ago, is to extent that there are interventions in the context of uh, child trafficking prevention, it's very much aimed at sort of the individual level without accounting for uh, structural factors. Uh, whereas if you contrast that with some really successful public health work, let's take road safety, right? There was a campaign certainly many years ago, pre-airbags, to have people wear seat belts. Uh, but it wasn't just relying on people to wear a seatbelt because eventually they developed airbags that were required in cars so that even if people don't wear their seatbelt, they still have some protection. We also made roads safer, we made cars safer. We did a lot of other things that wasn't simply putting the burden on an individual to change behavior. Uh, that was a piece of it, uh, but there's sort of much more holistic approach um, that recognizes uh, the, how each of these um, levels affects um, what we do. And the same with um, when we think about human trafficking, we can think about sort of the individual level, individual risk factors, um, but there's a whole lot else that's happening in different relationships that might make individuals more vulnerable to being trafficked or exploited in some way. And the same with community factors, school-based factors, neighborhood factors that might increase sort of resilience um, or increase risk uh, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so let's circle back then uh, quickly, how are we doing on time? Okay. 
Um, how am I, what, what, what might we do more specifically around these areas in the context of, of child trafficking or human trafficking more generally? Um, so in terms of evidence-based work, um, it's very, the, we're starting to develop some evidence on risk factors. Uh, it, in fairness, some of that, you know, so we know things like uh, in, the, in the sex trafficking context uh, that, a very, that sort of a very common, uh, so it's very common that trafficking victims have been sexually abused or suffered other forms of physical abuse when they were young. Um, those studies are retrospective studies, so that's so, so there's a limitation to that. Um, but that is it, it's a limitation to that, and yet that is some of the better research that's out there on protective factors. We know very little right now about what um, reduces vulnerability in this context. Um, Similarly, um, efficacy of assistance programs. If you look around at this, sort of, although there are a limited number, but if you look at our assistance programs, some sort of in, uh, in shelter care provides for three months of intensive therapy and other assistance programs, some six months, some 12 months. Obviously, that depends in, in part on the individual needs. Um, but what it, my assessment of uh, the, a number of the ones that I've seen um, is it's largely driven by funding, which is understandable but may not say anything about what impact it's having. Um, and, and that's not, that hasn't been evaluated very closely. Most programs have not been evaluated, or to the extent they haven't been evaluated sort of um, day one versus day 90 uh, and without any sort of follow-up. Um, what does that mean three months later? What does it mean to be in a rural in-facility care for 90 days or six months and, and then on six months and one day return to a high crime inner city neighborhood where everyone knows you were the person who was trapped. Right? What does that mean to you sort of be transitioning back and what impact it's gonna have a month from now or two months from now? And so there's very little on that. Um, there's almost nothing on labor trafficking, very, some anecdotal evidence, but we know very little about labor trafficking, um, which happens everywhere from sort of agricultural uh, construction, mining, restaurants, hospitality industry, uh, and so on and so forth. So we don't, we don't know a lot. And the last thing I just add in the evidence-based research context, um, like there's, there's not a whole lot of discussion these days about research ethics. Uh, one of the things I hear from, um, again, very well-intentioned NGOs working in this area is, oh, you, you can help with research? We have tons of data. Um, but setting aside the sort of evidence-based research component of it, which is what does the data look like, you know, sort of how, um, it's, they are sort of happy to share that data without any sense of uh, whether they have, whether they have, do they have consent to share that data. Um, and the whole, there's a whole host of um, ethical questions. Um, and I'm, a colleague and I in the States um, did sort of, a, well, I would say, a very sort of early attempt at sort of mapping some of the challenges associated with research ethics um, in child trafficking. I'm happy to talk more about that. All right. Focus on prevention, we talked about moving up the stream. Um, I'll just, and some of these we've already touched upon. Right? Again, uh, on vulnerability, I, in the prevent, when, this, when there are prevention discussions, it tends to be, um, this is what happens in the discussion. Well, it's really all about demand. Demand is what drives it, and therefore, the, we ought to just focus on demand. And while I'm, in, well, I don't entirely disagree with that. I'm skeptical about how much we can, uh, how much progress we can make on demand, um, let's say on labor trafficking. Most of, most of the folks in this room don't want to overpay for the clothing they wear or the, or the food they eat. Um, but how much, we, how much we are willing to do or are able to do um, to reduce demand for exploited labor, um, I'm not sure. I'm similarly uh, skeptical in the sex trafficking context. While I think it's important, um, I'm not sure we're going to sort of eliminate prostitution, um, at least not in the sort of near term. Um, so there's very little talk really about vulnerability where I think there needs to be much more work. And the demand work needs to be much more sophisticated, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But, but the demand, if you want to reduce demand, you ought to be thinking about, OK, what would it take consumers to make more, quote, unquote, better choices um, that would reduce the risk of somebody being exploit, exploited in the supply chain. 
Um, and that's a much more sophisticated conversation, I think, than I would sort of question um, then, okay, how do we prevent men from buying sex? Um, and then we talked about structural issues. All right. Um, here's where I think a lot of really interesting work can be done and where public health has some really great experience um, in addressing underlying behaviors and attitudes. Um, one of the things that we know uh, in the public, from public health research um, is that we know, a lot, we know a fair amount about what will it take to change somebody's behavior. Right? And one of the interesting things that, that I hope we can think through a little bit in this context is um, this operates differently from other public health issues, right? If you think about what's the vector here, what's the, what's the sort of, uh, let's take the sex trafficking context. Um, people will tend, one of the things that, that benefits public health initiatives is if you, if you get people to change their behavior, um, some benefit accrues to them, right? If, I, if you get me to stop smoking, full disclosure, I don't smoke. But if I did, and you got me to stop smoking, that I would accru the benefit would accrue to me immediately and long term. Uh, to the person who's sort of the purchaser or the demand of, in the sex trafficking context, what benefit accrues to them if they don't purchase sex? Um, they might argue that, in fact, they lose out on the benefit. Right? So maybe there's a reduced risk of, uh, arguably there's a reduced risk of sexually transmitted infections, but it, you know, query how much they are concerned about that. Uh, in the labor trafficking context, it's even more challenging, right? Um, okay, so if I don't, do I pay more? If, I, if instead of buying three t-shirts for $10, I buy one t-shirt for $35, those are maybe dated numbers, um, you know, am I any more confident that somebody's not getting exploited? Right, so, and, and does any benefit accrue to me? All I've done is spend more, right? So one of the things, so we know that that's one of the challenges that we face in this context. We do also know there's good research that shows that people will be altruistic, but they tend to be altruistic only if they know it'll make a difference, right? And so one of the things we need to think through in this context, and where I think other public health research is really interesting and informative, is thinking through, okay, what would it take, right? So there's, there needs to be a sort of threat associated with the sort of bad choice, um, and then so there's some benefit from the good choice, um, even if it's an altruistic one, a, a clear benefit, right? And so one of the challenges we have in the labor trafficking context, or even the sex trafficking context, is if I make the right choice, I don't have any confidence that it's going to reduce exploitation. And that's a real challenge for us as opposed to sort of, as contrasted with, say, youth smoking. Right? Um, and so I think there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done in a lot of, in a lot of ways where we um, can take uh, examples from other public health work and, see, uh, what, and sort of see how they might fit in this context. All right, a couple other things. Um, the, the partnerships of things, we talked about the importance of, like, there need to be, every sector has a role to play in this. And one of the really interesting things is we've seen sort of emerging examples of this, of um, simply identifying what are people are good at, right? Um, so I'll give you one example that sort of may seem far afield, um, but there was tra a trafficking of young boys in, into the United Arab Emirates um, some years ago to be ch camel jockeys. Uh, camel, jockey, camel racing is a popular sport uh, among some uh, part of society in the UAE, uh, and so they would traffic, and so four, five, six-year-old boys would be trafficked, suffer, live in horrible conditions, suffer gruesome injuries, <coughs> they in the middle of a race fell off the camel, and so finally after some pressure from human rights groups, um, they, the government said they need to do something. So who did they partner with ultimately? They ultimately partnered with a Swiss company that developed a robot jockey. Um, if, you, if you have spare time, I don't know if anyone has spare time these days, but if you have spare time, you can find it. Camel racing, robot jockey, just Google it, find it on YouTube. Uh, and they've just sort of developed a robot jockey. Now that doesn't solve the problem, right? So the kid in Bangladesh who might have been trafficked um, may not be any less vulnerable, but, it's, but, you, but we're not asking a Swiss company or even a company from the UAE to solve the problem. We're asking to figure out what they're good at and then do that. Right, so they can help alleviate that sort of element of demand. And then a whole lot of other things need to happen to make sure that a six-year-old in Bangladesh can get trafficked into or, or end up exploited by the same. Um, but that's a, you know, financial institutions are doing the same thing. So uh, one last example, sort of uh, a bank in the U.S. A credit that has a credit card division um, was asked to partner with law enforcement. And, and, they came, and so law enforcement came up with this financial footprint. Like what are the things, uh, you know, a lot of round number transactions late at night. This is in the sex trafficking context, right? Who buys things for $200 at 2 a.m.? 
right? Who runs a credit card? That, you know, that's not a common. There's not a lot of things you can buy for an exact round dollar, right? And a whole set of things that you have. Are you paying for tolls in a certain world? Are you renting from the sort of? I don't know if they have them here, but sort of DVD in grocery stores in the United States. You can have these sort of um, kiosks that where you can rent DVDs. Why is that relevant in this context? Well, we know in the sex trafficking context that traffickers sometimes just rent a bunch of those and not have whoever is working for them you know, or exploited by them um, sitting around watching videos until the next client comes in. So they got put to the banks, coordinated with law enforcement, and then took their 80 million credit cards, ran their sort of financial trafficking footprint, uh, and came up with about 80 to 100 cards that seemed to sort of have red flags. Now, you know, for a financial company to, to run a number, sort of run a program through 80 million credit cards, a fraction of the time it would, take, it would have taken law enforcement to get anywhere with that, right? And so that's what we're looking for in this context. I'm thinking about where healthcare professionals in, in emergency departments and so on and so forth. Where, where are the opportunities? The last thing, and here we sort of think about this often in public health, uh, we ought to be talking to survivors much more, and we ought to be thinking about the target communities and involving them in, sort of from the outset in everything that we're doing. And we often see sort of very top-down initiatives um, that don't really involve um, survivor voices. Uh, or when they're involved, um, survivors are asked to sort of provide these sort of emotional pull, right? So one of the things you see in a lot of legislative hearings, congressional hearings in the States, is that they'll open and say, today we'll hear from three experts and one survivor. Why is that not for experts, right? Um, and just sort of the mindset of like, okay, we're gonna hear from a survivor just so people know how serious it is, but not actually take what they say seriously. Um, and so there's been a real devaluation or ignoring of survivors, and that really needs to change. Um, all right. Ultimately, you know, so I, I, I'm lobbying for and sort of advocating for the public health approach, but I think there's a lot we can take, even in, from the criminal justice uh, world, there, from human rights, from international development, from labor processes, there's a lot of different sort of strategies and methodologies that can inform the development of a comprehensive response. But I do think something that's anchored in a public health approach really has an opportunity to make a significant difference. Um, and so I have one other thing I want to sort of focus on, um, and then I'll um, wrap up. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is this poster that was on my, on my wall when I was a kid. Um, I was a feisty little political kid. Um, right, so this says, uh, spot the refugee. There he is, fourth row, second from the left. Um, this, the one with the mustache, obvious, really. Uh, maybe not, and then they go on to say, like, look, um, long story short, check your bias, right? And one of the things that, one of the challenges in human trafficking and child trafficking, like any issue, right, is that, that we're confronting a lot of bias, we're confronting sort of ideology that's driving um, a lot of the work. Uh, we tend to be, we, we've been really slow in the states recognizing that we are driving a lot of what's happening. Um, in the early years in the United States, it was seen as a problem with only foreigners involved. Um, and then we eventually realized it wasn't just foreign victims, but it was mostly sort of the other who was involved in perpetrating the crimes. And the reality is that we've talked about the sort of labor, the demand for, for clothing we don't want to pay too much for, for fruits and vegetables that we don't want to pay too much for, um, is that we're all sort of tied into this and responsible for the exploitation that's happening. Um, I don't have great confidence um, that what I'm wearing today wasn't made by somebody who is, you know, that there wasn't somebody exploited in the supply chain at some point. Um, so, um, so, but I think there's a lot of biases that, sort of, that, that has permeated this field. Um, the essentialized victim has led us to often, for a long time, overlook boys who are exploited. In the, particularly in sex trafficking. We've overlooked trans youth. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of focusing on the sort of quintessential victim. Victims or survivors who sort of are proactive and exercise agency are often not believed because they don't, they don't present as a sort of a centralized passive victim. Um, and so there's problems there. On the other side, um, we've, we've sort of not had a clear sense of the diversity of traffickers. So one of the things we've seen in a lot in the last 20 years is women are often recruiters. I mean, in some countries, they might be as many as 40%, 50% of, of the sort of initial recruiters. Right? 
And so we're not, you know, if all we're looking for is that sort of stereotypical classic trafficker that you've seen in Hollywood films, um, you're missing out. Um, and if, and although it seems silly, it turns out those Hollywood films have an enormous impact and they shape, they shape what advocates think about the issue and they shape what policymakers think about the issue. Um, so as we're doing all this work, we need to be sort of uh, attuned to sort of all the bias that's in here, implicit or explicit, uh, and sort of challenging that. So we actually address, this brings us back to the evidence-based research piece, right? So we actually address what the problem is and, and the root causes. All right, with that in mind, um, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Fire away. Yes, please. Um, I suppose if you were to establish a baseline, where, where would you start? How would you actually go about, say, if you, had, if you got a, a funding opportunity, how would you actually go about trying to measure what the, what the problem is as a baseline? Yeah, so it's a great question. I, I, I think that you've got to, I think there are some efforts under the way, underway, sort of small, Localities, and that maybe gives us a sense of what is what is what is the number or what might the range be in a particular city. Um, but I think you're right. There's some real challenges with this. I think there's a little bit of an obsession with the numbers as well. Um, they're all over the place for one, um, but there's also an obsession that we have to have a number. Um, and I and I you know I've just uh, earlier pushed for sort of clear research, but I. I think that, you know, I, I guess the example I'd point to is some of the work that's been done on child abuse reporting, right? I think we have pretty good, we have a pretty good sense of the scope of the problem, even though I don't think we have um, complete confidence that we know exactly how many children are abused. We know the reporting's much better now, right? And this is the sort of, this was the experience, this is the trajectory of in trafficking and in child abuse. Once we started looking for the problem, then we started to find out, you know, more and more cases. Right? Um, and and so I think that that shift could happen. I don't suggest it's necessarily the same scale, um, but I I think we can get to sort of a pro, sort of a better sense of better reporting, get a better sense of those sort of identified cases, um, and then you know people in a number of sort of um, you know, there's a lot of work being done and a lot of illicit activity where we can get a sense of what might that sort of realistic projection be if this is the number that we've been able to identify. And I don't think we're even there in terms of sort of going that far with prevalence. So that, I guess I would suggest that as a first step. Yeah, I, I was going to ask a very similar question. Oh, good. Um, but I, I, I think it's very interesting what you say there uh, about the, 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 the I mean, we have many of us working in public health, um, you know, the, not so much an obsession, but a, a sort of a, a seeming necessity, disciplinary necessity, if you like, to have figures. And as you say, the issue is perhaps less about figures, it's more about the scope. We know there is a problem, and perhaps um, there's a different way of measuring it. What I find very interesting is your comparison with child abuse because this is by nature the fact that it's trafficking. Um, is it then, I suppose one of my questions is, is this necessarily international? It's the definition of child trafficking. Does it necessarily mean that a child has to come from another country if you like? Is there Yes, so it has been. So, so trafficking can be inter-country or intra-country by definition, um, and there's been a strong. I mean, one of the challenges in this field is there's a, there's quite a bit of ideological battle over the de definition, uh, and so there's many in this world, including a number of researchers, researchers who would say trafficking doesn't involve movement at all necessarily. I think it's fair to say that that wasn't the original intent of the term. The term was implying some sort of movement, even if it was intra-country, 
Um, but the reality is it's really been pushed to a much broader, uh, you know, there's sort of what a colleague of mine in the States refers to as um, exploitation creep, this sort of ever-growing definition that's all under this umbrella of human trafficking. And I, I think that presents problems for measurement um, as well, uh, because now even if you do get a baseline or, or, or how do you, even if you get agreement that we need a baseline, how do you get agreement if people are using different definitions? Um, you know, and there's been a sort of very significant sort of discussion around prostitution and trafficking. Um, there are some who take the view that they are synonymous. Every prostitution case is a trafficking case. Um, and that change, that obviously would change the measurement and sort of the numbers. Um, and so I think the real challenges, uh, you know, I should mention that earlier, there are real challenges around the definition. Uh, in some respects, the definition for child trafficking is easier because the issue of consent is not present in that context. And there's been a lot of sort of discussion and debate around the sort of role of consent. Um, so that trafficking, for those who are unfamiliar, has sort of three components. Right? Is it some sort of act? Is an act means and purpose, right? The act is recruiting, harboring, transferring, transporting, maintaining somebody. Uh, in this sort of trafficking in front. The means is by way of force, fraud, or coercion, unless it's a child, you don't have to establish that. Uh, and then the purpose has to be for the purpose of some sort of exploitation, either in a labor setting or in a commercial sex context. Um, and uh, so not having to sort of have that question about force, fraud, or coercion makes it easier to sort of uh, get agreement but that sort of first piece, the act, um, the original intent of, you know, the sort of different terms, recruit, harbor, transfer, it was meant to capture the different points on the sort of the process. Um, what it's been interpreted as, as, okay, if all, I, if I just, you know, if I am a, here in Cork and I exploit somebody, a, a child in the commercial sex industry, um, I've maintained them, so that technically meets the definition of trafficking, even though I, I, they, we may have never left as, you know, the same city block. Um, and, you know, a lot, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether that's a constructive expansion of the definition. Just kind of that question, uh, how far off do you, well, in reality, I suppose, is there a lot of variation or various definition in different regions of the world? And if so, how far off would, you, would we be to kind of yeah, so there is an umbrella term in, in international law, but of course different states have sort of departed from that to some extent. I think there is a lot of debate on the, the, the coercion piece. I, there's also, a, to add to the complexity, there's, a, there's the legal definition for sort of criminal justice purposes, and then there's a sort of, I don't mean this pejoratively, but a looser definition that, that, that advocates and others work with in terms of identifying and sort of figuring out who they're gonna work, what population are they serving. And those aren't always uh, coextensive. Uh, but there is an international definition. And the problem is that while we have agreement, it hasn't settled the debate. And um, I mean, particularly it's evolved around sex trafficking, right? Um, and I think it's, you know, the moment sex is involved um, in whatever the issue, you tend to end up with a lot of ideological battles. And without weighing in on that, although I have very, very particular view, without weighing in on it, um, you know, I think that creates real problems. And, and, and I think a lot of what we've seen um, in the sex trafficking context has been sort of uh, hampered by ideological battles. Um, and I think that's a, that, that you know, that's just a political piece of it that I think is challenging. But those of us who work in public health and you know, work with any public health issues, you can't avoid politics. Right? It's at every level, right? It's at funding. Um, and that's, coming back to the numbers, that's the critical piece, right? So sometimes I think in the pub world of public health, we're in the world of law, we're like, okay, look, we can get a sense of scope without a precise number. But you go to any member of parliament, legislator, and the first thing they ask you or their staffers ask you is, so how big a problem is it? What's the number? Um, and that, you talk to the media, what's the number? And that's a real challenge. Um, and I'm, you know, 
uh, we, you know, those of us who work in this need to do better in responding to that without sort of giving into the temptation of some 